Well, we are honored to be able to close out our season here with uh, a person who's been with us twice over the past couple seasons. Dennis Larson's made presentations here about the Natchez Pass, and Ezra Meeker is Hops King. And so we wanted to invite him here once again to talk about one of the most interesting characters in Northwest history, Ezra Meeker. He's a retired, for, the, for those of you who don't know Dennis, uh, he is a retired high school history teacher from Yelm High School, a uh, member of the Oregon California Trails Association, uh, the Puyallup Historical Society at the Meeker Mansion, and also the Tumwater Historical Association. And for the past 20 years, he's been researching and writing about Northwest pioneers. Uh, he's the author and co-author of six books. A lot of them are on the table in the back. Before you leave, you might want to check that out. Uh, many historical articles, and he's lectured in venues all around the country from Washington to Maine. So we're privileged to have him. He's written four of his books about Ezra Meeker, and that's the subject of today's topic, and uh, I'm guessing he doesn't care for long introductions. So let's have a warm Schmidt House welcome for Dennis Larson. <laughs> okay, thank you, Don. Has everybody had a chance to kind of read what you do when you become a senior citizen? <laughs> kind of intimidating, isn't it? <laughs> okay, um, today I'm going to be telling you about Ezra Meeker and his quest to save the Oregon Trail. And I'm going to be talking primarily about the later years of his life from, oh, say, age 70 to age 97. And he did so much stuff, it's just rather amazing. But uh, First, I want to start off by giving you a little bit of background about Ezra and his life history if you don't know much about him. In 1852, he came west over the Oregon Trail from Iowa, and he settled in Washington Territory. Now, he came with his wife and infant child, and at first he settled in the Stelicum area and eventually in Puyallup. And from 1867 to 1896, he became one of the wealthiest men in the state primarily growing and brokering hops. In 1898, after losing his hop fortune, he joined the Klondike Gold Rush, and he was in the Yukon until 1901. He actually went over Chilkoot Pass with the first herd in 1898, the famous avalanche that you might know about. If you know that history, he, was, he just missed it by a day. And uh, his story could have ended right there. When he got up north, he opened a grocery store, and he mined the miners. Uh, he sold groceries to the miners, and he called his place the Log Cabin Grocery Store. And it was a fixture in Dawson City for about six years. In the years 1903 to 1905, he did several things. He was one of the early presidents of the Washington State Historical Society. He wrote a book called Pioneer Reminiscences and the Tragedy of Leshi and he exhibited at the Lewis and Clark Exposition down in Portland. But what I'm going to get to today is what he did with the rest of his life. Um, in 1906, the old Oregon Trail was fast disappearing to the plow and development. And the memory of what the pioneers had suffered and accomplished was fading from the collective American mind. Meeker was home from the Klondike, had celebrated his golden wedding anniversary, and he was done with the business world and he was nearing what he erroneously thought were the end years of his life. Among the last of his class still living, at age 75, Meeker decided to change that reality. His moment had arrived. The Oregon Trail beckoned. His plan was to take a covered wagon and an ox team east over the Oregon Trail, placing monuments along the way, and eventually reaching the nation's capital in a meeting with President Teddy Roosevelt. Now, his daughter, when she heard about this, was appalled. <laughs> and she knew her father very well, and she appealed to his vanity and said, Dad, people are going to laugh at you if you go out there and do this at your age. That was to no avail. A minister, uh, he went to Portland, and he solicited contributions for this effort from a, a minister in Portland. And instead, he got a sermon from the pulpit <laughs> where the minister urged the congregation, don't do anything to aid this old man going out there in the Great Plains to die. <laughs> well, he had no intention of dying. 
he was essentially a one-man show when he started, but nevertheless, he persisted, and the old Oregon Trail Monument Expedition was born. Its goals were three. The first was to mark the trail with monuments of some kind. The second was to perpetuate the memory of the pioneers, what they had done, what they would accomplished. And the third was to build a transcontinental highway along the route of the Oregon Trail. And he called this Pioneer Way. But he made a transition from the businessman on the left with the nice business overcoat and the trim beard and the trimmed locks to the scruffy old pioneer that's on the right here. And uh, this became his new image. This is what the public wanted, and this is what he gave them. And by the time he got to be 83, he'd gone full wild. <laughs> he, uh, he actually wrote that it took him a couple hours in the morning to look like this. <laughs> Okay, this is the map that shows the route that he took. The Monument Expedition was three years long, and he went overland with an ox team and covered wagon along the Oregon Trail, and the first year he made it as far as Indianapolis, Indiana, and then he wintered. The next year, that ox team took him through Ohio and New York and down to Washington, D.C., and eventually to Pittsburgh, where he wintered the second year, and the third year, he made his way back home, and a good chunk of the route back home was by rail. Now, in 1906, believe it or not, ox teams had become a novelty. And they drew crowds like this, especially in big cities. This is in New York City. Um, each evening, at each stop, he would do a slideshow, just like I'm doing. And he would tell stories about his 1852 trip over the Oregon Trail. And he would show 100 slides on this ancient slide projector, which is called a stereopticon, or some people call it a magic lantern. He didn't do it totally alone. When he was in the Dalles, this guy stuck his head in Meeker's tent and he said, I heard you're looking for help. And this guy was about maybe 30 years old, William Mardon, and Meeker was 75, and he kind of looked at Mardon and said, this isn't really the kind of help I need. <laughs> but desperation kind of you know, makes bedfellows, and he hired him. And Mardon stuck. And he stayed with Meeker until 1912. And you can honestly say, without Mardon's help, Meeker could not have accomplished half of what he did. Quite often, Ezra would go ahead by train to a, a city up the way to make advance arrangements, to you know, rent a hall, to you know, find a camping place for the wagon. Uh, something feed for the oxen and things like that and Mardon would trail along behind with the covered wagon and the ox team and you know he also later on helped Meeker sell books and postcards and actually was signing legal contracts for Meeker before he was done now they didn't always get along when you're living close like that you sometimes have friction and Mardon had a temper a bad one that occasionally got the best of him and he had a few habits that Meeker didn't f like you know, and we won't even go into those, but, uh, and, uh, but they made it, and the, the partnership lasted. This is the first monument that he put up in Oregon, and it's at the Dalles, and you'll notice that there's some school children up in front. What Ezra wanted to do was get the school children involved as much as he could possibly do in the dedication ceremonies, because he was passing the baton from one generation to the next. And he came up with a whole variety of ways to get the kids involved. One was like here they're up in front singing a patriotic song like America the Beautiful or something like that. Sometimes he would lead a procession from his campsite up to where the monument was. And the children would follow behind the covered wagon. And sometimes he would have the kids pile stones one at a time at the base of the monument. When he got to Baker City, he, an idea popped into his head and he said, you know, if these kids contributed dimes and nickels toward this thing, that would really increase their, you know, their ownership. And he's, so he took his journal, and he had each kid sign their name and how much they contributed. Now, for Baker City, that journal covers 46 pages of names. I mean, and he did that at all the stops after Baker City along the way. 
Now, the monuments were for places where there were population centers, uh, where there weren't, you know, populations, but he thought there should be something. He put up a wooden post like this one. Uh, the highway department actually put this one up, but he put one very similar and in the same place. This is in Biggs, Oregon, where the Oregon Trail comes down to the Columbia River. And you can actually park there and walk up the Oregon Trail if you know where to look. Sometimes you just paint a stone like this. Old Oregon Trail, 1843 to 57. Now, 1843 makes sense because that was when the first real wagon train came west. 1857 makes no sense at all and we've never been able to find out why Meeker chose that date to put on every monument. It's a mystery. And I have talked to Oregon Trail experts all around the country and nobody can come up with an answer for why he pulled that date out of the hat. What's a better date? Um, well, the Oregon Trail kept in use until mid-1860s, you know, with good use. Um, it actually was used sometimes by some people as late as the turn of the century. And, you know, even after the railroads were built, there were people who didn't have money that could, you know, to pay for a railroad ticket, so they would come overland. Not as many, obviously, but, you know, some. So where did he get the stones? Was he calling those stones in the woods? No, he, he got the stones from uh, local quarries, and they were all usually made locally. Now, um, when he got to Pendleton, he discovered the power of the press. And you see the little headline here, Old Oregon Trail marked by a red stone monument. Stories like this appeared at every stop along the way. By the time he got to Washington, D.C., he had appeared in over 1,000 newspapers. And by the time he got to Washington, D.C., he was a national figure. And he had made the Saving the Oregon Trail a national thing. And he also became the face of the Oregon Trail. Now, there's a theme about these monuments. The Pendleton, a lot of them have been moved. The Pendleton Monument's been moved three times. Uh, the one on the left, it was taken in, in 2006, and it was located then on the grounds of the state penitentiary. Uh, it got moved a couple years ago to the cemetery on the south side of town, and I can tell you that's a better location. Uh, from experience, we know now that wandering around a state prison with a camera taking pictures is a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the monuments are on private property. And on the left is uh, a place called Straw Creek Ranch, which is in rural eastern Oregon. And you can see Meeker's up there with his dog, and he's uh, you know got a handful of people there at this monument. I'm on my hands and knees with my better part showing, trying to uh, get a good picture of this monument. When I came back a few years later, it was gone. And we moseyed down to the farmhouse, and it, there it was sitting in front of the farmhouse. And we talked to the people, and they said, well, we moved it for security reasons. We kind of think they just wanted to have it in their front yard. <laughs> Some of them haven't fared well over time. This one in Wyoming, as you can see, has shrunk considerably. Looks like a couple cars have bashed into it also. And two of them were stolen. This one in Nisa, for example. Nisa is a little town right on the Snake River over in eastern Oregon. And Meeker ordered this monument when he was in Idaho at Boise. It was quarried at Boise. And it was set up on the Idaho side of the Snake River at the site of Old Fort Boise. And one side of this monument reads Old Oregon Trail, and the other side reads Fort Boise. Well, it got stolen in 1922. And what happened was the city of Ontario, which is right on the border, but on the Oregon side, was talking about maybe you know, moving it up to their place. Well, two enterprising souls, a guy named Frank Stubbs and Art Cook, decided that it belonged to Nisa. So they went and stole it and brought it to Nisa, and they leaned it up against the uh, city council building. A couple days later, a guy from Idaho came snooping around trying to find the monument that just had vanished mysteriously. And uh, so they whisked it down to Vail in the middle of the night, hid it in the hardware store until things cooled down. And then they brought it back to Nisa and they leaned it this time up against the Chamber of Commerce building. And the city father said, it's an act of providence. 
we're going to put this monument up on our side of the river where it is today with a nice highway department kiosk beside telling the story of the Oregon Trail in that part of Oregon. About oh, a few years back, Idaho was celebrating its sesquicentennial, and they listed all the monuments that are in Idaho along the Oregon Trail, and they put down for this one missing. All they had to do was go across the river. <laughs> The second one that was stolen got found here just recently. It was stolen in 1920. Uh, it was placed at Lads Canyon just outside of Legrand, and a farmer came and stole it and took it to his house and used it as a doorstep. <laughs> and he turned it upside down so the inscription was down, and that's where it stayed. And he died and it got passed on to the next generation and to the next generation. And the generation that finally got it, set it up in their yard as a yard ornament. There was a policeman in Legrand named Ronnie Allen who was retired doing some historical research and he got a tip that this monument was there. So he drove out to the farmhouse and as he drove in he saw it sitting there in the yard and he said, that's the missing Meeker monument. And he bought it for 150 bucks. He donated it to the Bureau of Land Management, and it's on display now at the Oregon Trail Interpretive Center in Baker City. I teased Ronnie a lot. I said, Ronnie, what is a retired cop doing buying stolen property? <laughs> the, the picture at the bottom is we had a symposium, an uh, Oregon Trail symposium in La Grande in May, and they brought the monument down from Baker City to La Grande, to, and we're loading it in the car here. Just give you an idea how big it was. It wasn't a very big monument. It weighed about 150 pounds. When he got to Idaho, he started making postcards like this and selling them. And it was a way to kind of make money to meet expenses. This monument is, he called the Children's Monument, and it's on the Capitol grounds at Boise. And here he is with a postcard at Chimney Rock in Nebraska. And here's another postcard. This is what the Oregon Trail looked like in Nebraska in, you know, 1906. You can see the rut is huge. And then he got to New York City eventually and made a postcard there. And you'll notice there's a woman sitting in the wagon. What Mrs. Mardon. Mardon met her at a restaurant and at a courtship that lasted three days, they got married. I'll give him a week. Maybe it was a week, but it was three days to a week. Ezra was just appalled when Mardon told him he'd been married. And he, he thought, well, he wrote his daughter. He says, you know, what kind of morals does this woman have that would marry a guy after three days? Well, his tune changed because a few days later he wrote his wife, I mean, not his wife, his daughter, and said, Mrs. Mardon is a great cook. She's a wonderful salesperson, and she's free. <laughs> Mrs. Mardon stuck. She stayed with them all the way through to 1912 with a, with, with a couple absences. He eventually made it to Washington, D.C. in that meeting with Teddy Roosevelt, and he spent a month there lobbying for passage of what was called the Humphrey Bill, which was the, a bill introduced in Congress to get the federal government involved in monumenting the Oregon Trail and protecting it. Unfortunately, it didn't pass, and if the congressman thought that was the end of Ezra Meeker, they were seriously wrong because he was back time and time again. As he made his way east, he wrote a book called The Ox Team or the Old Oregon Trail, and he sold, it went through four editions, and he sold 19,000 copies. And of those postcards, he sold a half a million. And that's how he paid for this expedition. When he came back to Seattle, he was, like I said, a national figure, and he was welcomed kind of as a conquering hero, and he had $75,000 in his pocket in today's money. So what do you do with that? Well, Seattle was having their own World's Fair called the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition, and Meeker said, I want in. And they let him in. He set up this giant Oregon Trail exhibit. He plowed all $75,000 into it and then borrowed a ton more. And the director of the exposition said, Ezra, this isn't the kind of exhibit the public wants to look at today. And Ezra just ignored him. 
and he lost it all. So people wouldn't pay for admission to go in and see it. And, you know, he didn't meet expenses. Now, I'll describe the exhibit. On the hill there is a block house that he brought down from Whidbey Island. Uh, the log cabins in the back, one of them he brought some women from Kentucky who knew how to operate spinning wheels and looms and things like that. One of them was a replica of the Jason Lee missionary cabin that was down in Salem, Oregon. Uh, he had a Native American encampment in the back who performed daily. And then the Mardons were in the covered wagon selling books and postcards. And over on the left was a restaurant. And the restaurant was called, of course, the Pioneer's Restaurant. And you can see the sign over there. He charged 10 cents for people to come in to see the exhibit in the back. The restaurant was the only part of this thing that made any money, and it didn't make much. These are the restaurant workers. It was a family affair. On the far left there, that's Ezra's half-brother Aaron, and his wife Fanny is next to him. Then in between are three nieces. To Ezra's uh, left is a daughter-in-law, and there are some more nieces and stuff scattered in the back. He was so broke at the end of this that he couldn't even pay these people, you know, his relatives, what he owed them. He, was able, he had to, you know, pay them off in time over the next couple, three years. So what did he do? I mean, he shut down his exhibit partway through the fair and realized the only way he was going to make money was go down to Los Angeles and Southern California and sell books and postcards again. So that's what they did. They went from city to city throughout Southern California. And on, you can see the tent where they slept in there in the city street. And you see a table there with a woman sitting by it. That's just Mrs. Mardon selling the books and postcards. William is standing by the oxen. And any tourists that come by would get a little lesson in how oxen worked. And then Ezra's there with his collie, it was a dog Jim, by the wagon. He'd give a little impromptu talk whenever anyone showed up and then invite them to come to the slideshow that he was doing that night, which, for which he charged admission. When he was down there, he went to the Los Angeles Air Show and stayed there for the week that it ran. And uh, he was fascinated with these early airplanes. The Wright brothers were even in the audience. They weren't down there to fly, though. They were down there to sue. They were involved in a patent dispute with somebody, and they were down there taking care of that business. This one I like because it shows the, you know, the juxtaposition of you know, the wagon and the airplanes. It's kind of a neat picture. He turned these into postcards and sold them. Now, in March of 1910, two bills were introduced in Congress, one in the Senate, one in the House, companion bills. And they said they were going to appoint a commissioner to oversee the survey of the Oregon Trail, determine how many monuments were needed to mark it properly, where they should go, and how much they should cost. And that commissioner was supposed to make a report to the Secretary of War. When he approved it, an appropriation of a million and a quarter in today's money would be released. Everybody agreed Ezra Meeker would be that commissioner. That meant a second monument expedition. And the plan for this one was to survey the trail and mark the sites for those future monuments with a steel pipe and a brass cap. But money problems kind of haunted him the whole way. And he himself called this expedition a failure. But as you'll see, it was anything but. This is what the Oregon Trail looked like going over the Blue Mountains in 1910. You know, you guys have gone up over I-84 over the Blue Mountains. Well, this is the early version. And here he is in Baker City selling his books from his covered wagon. When he got to Boise, he purchased what are called GLO maps, government land office maps, and he began marking the trail on them. And what he would do is he would set the map up at his campsite, and all the old pioneers would come up, and they'd say, you know, this crossing here was kind of famous, or this place here was kind of neat. And he would eventually figure out where the monuments should go in Idaho. And his plan was that he would make a giant map 200 feet long of the entire Oregon Trail. And when he got to Washington, D.C., he was going to roll this thing out on the floors of Congress as a visual aid, quite a visual aid. This map still exists. It's in Tacoma in the Research Center the, uh, for the Washington State Historical Society. He figured he'd need 700 monuments before he was done. 
When he got to Wyoming, he did the same thing. And he squeezed in a photo op with the governor and turned it into a postcard and was able to sell it. I'm sure the governor allowed that. He made it all the way across uh, the Oregon Trail and he got to Springfield, Illinois, and this is Abe Lincoln's house. And he spent a week here, again, selling postcards and preaching Oregon Trail. And uh, he's way off the Oregon Trail now, though. Now, he estimated that in three years in this trip, he lectured to over 200,000 people. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. You know, this is before microphones and everything. And uh, he also uh, did this just newspaper thing like you can't believe. Everywhere you went in the Midwest, there were newspaper stories about Ezra Meeker. And his plan in 1911 was to go through New England because he'd never been there. But look at the map. Where'd he end up? <laughs> Texas. What happened? Started OK. Uh, you know, this is the newspaper from Marion, Ohio. And he went ahead and made arrangements, like I mentioned earlier. And Mardons came behind with the wagon. And when he got to Columbus, he ran into something called the Blue Laws. Now, Columbus is the capital of Ohio, so the state legislature was in session. And you know what blue laws are? You can't do things on Sunday, certain things, one of which was to you know, give a lecture at a hall. Well, when the mayor told Ezra that if he gave a lecture at his hall, he would be in violation of the law and he'd throw you in jail if you did it, Ezra researched the law. And he saw that it was written rather vaguely. He said, you know, if they apply this, that means every minister who gives a sermon on Sunday is going to jail. <laughs> and so he decided to challenge the mayor. He gave free tickets to every member of the state legislature and to every member of the press. And then he sent two complimentary tickets to the mayor and his wife. <laughs> Printed up this flyer, put it all over town. And then he wrote a letter to his daughter and says, don't be surprised if you hear I've been arrested. <laughs> Well, he gave the talk on Sunday. Uh, the mayor didn't show. The police didn't show. Ezra just kind of smiled, collected the receipts, and continued on his way. He got as far east as Niagara Falls. And then something very unusual for Ezra happened. He left the covered wagon there with the Mardons, and he went ahead to Rochester, New York, to talk to the mayor of that city to get permission and everything. And the mayor called him a charlatan, a thief, a con artist, all kinds of things. And Ezra turned tail and ran. And I kind of, it's the only time he ever did anything like that in his entire life. And there's a backstory to it. Uh, he was desperately in need of funds at this point, which he kept secret from everybody. And he knew that the Midwest was way more trail friendly, would buy his books and postcards. And he figured if he was going to run into a buzzsaw of op opposition in New England and New York, he was just going to go back to the Midwest where people were more friendly. So he did. He retreated to Iowa and he started hitting the state fair circuit and the county fairs. And he went through Iowa and Wisconsin and Minnesota, North and South Dakota. And eventually he made his way down to Oklahoma. And at that point he said, you know, I'm going to be here in the winter. Let's go down to Texas where the weather's a little nicer. And on his way through Oklahoma, he met a guy named Joe Gibbs who was running a Wild West show. And he had these oxen that were supposed to be the largest oxen in North America. Ezra leased them with an option to buy and took them with him to Texas. And he made it all the way down to this here where he exhibited them. And he charged people to come and see them. And he put a big canvas tent around it. And when the holiday season arrived, Ezra got to camp in this place. Now, if you've ever been to the Alamo, if you're a man and you're wearing a hat, you are required to take it off when you go inside. And in Texas, this is a shrine. How Ezra managed to camp inside of it for you know the holiday season, I never was able to learn. Uh, come January 7th, they eventually told him he had to leave. And Texas wasn't friendly financially to Ezra. He was about as broke as he could be when he left Texas. He borrowed money from a cousin to ship up to St. Louis. And then at St. Louis, uh, he made his way with borrowed money north to 
Council Bluffs in Iowa. And here the Mardons left, and they parted ways for good. And he hired another guy named Judson Barrett, who was a professional photographer. And Ezra figured out that people like to have their picture taken with an ox team in a covered wagon, and they'll pay for it. But how long did it take to develop a picture back in those days? A while. And what they did was they came up with a portable darkroom that could be put in the back of the wagon, and they could develop them right on the spot. And so, you know, the people could get their picture taken and walk away with the picture shortly after. He continued on alone to Denver when disaster struck. Uh, Dave, one of the oxen, came up lame, couldn't pull the wagon anymore. And a flash flood hit the city, and it almost wiped out the wagon, but it totally destroyed his stock. I mean, it just soaked everything. So he threw in the towel, and he says, I'm going home. And he didn't have enough money to go home. So he wired his uh, son-in-law and said, could you send me some money for a train? And they, he, they sent him some money. He got to ride home with the oxen and the wagon and his dog in the August heat in a boxcar. <laughs> Not first class. <laughs> And on the way home, he had some good news and bad news. The bad news was his dog that had been with him all along jumped out of the, uh, the boxcar and disappeared. And Ezra looked and looked and was never able to find him. Uh, more on the good news side, the bill passed in the Senate. On the bad news side, it didn't pass in the House of Representatives. So he came home pretty broke, <laughs> really broke, and he donated the oxen and the wagon to the Tacoma Park Department. And they were out at Point Defiance, where they pastured them while they were alive. And the plan was, when they died, they were going to be taxidermied and put in a glass case like this and exhibited. And if they ever found the dog, he was going in there, too, along with some of Meeker's stuff. But another World's Fair reared its head, the Panama Pacific Exposition. And Ezra got a position down there in the Washington State Pavilion. And he borrowed the oxen and the wagon and headed south. Dandy, unfortunately, died in Portland on the way south. And when they got down to San Francisco, Dave was dispatched. Why? Because he needed a matched pair to exhibit. At, and Dave was basically executed. And the two of them were there in, side by side in the uh, Washington State Pavilion with the wagon. Here's Ezra with all his books and postcards and everything. And he also lectured each evening and he was on a salary. And so by the end of the year there, he was financially solvent again. So is that a statue for a, for a taxi? That's the taxidermied oxen. Mm -hmm. That's Dave and Dandy. Oh, they taxidermied they taxi them both. Hauled them down and hauled them back. They hauled them, hauled them down, <laughs> yeah. They were actually taxidermied in Tacoma and then shipped down to San Francisco. <laughs> Now, in 1915, automobiles were getting to be really common, but good roads weren't. And you're going to see about that in a minute. There are a lot of pictures like this of Ezra sitting in a car, looks like he's driving. He didn't know how to drive. He even wrote in his, his memoirs, he says, I didn't know how to drive. But it, these are all faked. But anyhow, while he was sitting in a Pathfinder car at the exposition with World War I raging, an idea popped into his head. You know, that cross-country highway, it can be built as a defense measure. Of course, it will follow the Oregon Trail right up to Seattle. But uh, so flush with cash, a new plan was born. Needed a covered wagon with a stove and a bed on an automobile body. Now, first, he tried to get Studebaker to make this, and they wouldn't. And eventually, he got the Pathfinder Company in uh, Indianapolis to do it. You see the chimney in the middle? It had a stove in there. It had a bed in there. It was the nation's first motorized RV. <laughs> There's a driver there, too. You can just see his head peeking over Ezra's shoulder. He went through nine drivers on this trip for a whole variety of reasons. This is the route that he took with this Pathfinder automobile, um, a big circle route around the United States went over the Oregon Trail. And you see in Wyoming, there's a little side detour. What's up there? Yellowstone. Yellowstone, yeah. Well, this meant another book. And you can see on the cover there, it was going to originally be called the Schooner Mobile.
but that disappeared really quick and it became the Pathfinder. And he met President Woodrow Wilson before he took off and tried to get Wilson to sign on to the idea of Pioneer Way. And I like this picture because he's towing, you know, 1916 an RV towing, you know, kind of different. Now on that little visit to Yellowstone that he made, they, uh, <laughs> this was kind, kind of interesting. He told his driver, you're off the clock. Now, how's he going to get to Yellowstone if the driver doesn't drive? <laughs> but he wasn't going to get paid. <laughs> and the driver was good with that. He wanted to see Yellowstone, too. So the two of them went and toured Yellowstone, probably with the first RV to ever go there. And uh, they took a bunch of pictures and made a pamphlet, which they sold. And this is outside of Pendleton. This is what the roads looked like in eastern Oregon in 1916. Not very good. And here he is with driver number five in Seattle in front of the Goodyear tire place. Goodyear was around back then. Now the Pathfinder made it as far as Louisiana, where it basically broke. And they shipped it back to the factory, much the worse for wear. And he went by train to Washington, DC. But he got there, and the United States had just entered World War I, and they had no time for Ezra. So what did he do? He went home, and he started what he called a victory garden. He grew it over in his daughter's property on the east side of Lake Washington, and donated all the proceeds to the Red Cross. In addition to that, he started lobbying a guy named Herbert Hoover, who was in charge of food production during World War I, to build food drying plants all over the country. And uh, he succeeded right at the end of the war in getting Hoover to do that. Now, I mentioned he was enamored of airplanes. His very first flight was at age 88. So those of you who are not yet 88 and haven't flown, there's opportunities. Uh, his idea was he was going to fly around Mount Rainier. But there was a big forest fire burning, so he was stuck just flying around Tacoma and looking at that. Uh, the next year, he managed to get in a mail plane going from Seattle to Victoria. And at the bottom right corner there, you can see he flew from Lewiston to Spokane at age 89. But his most famous flight took place in 1924 at age 93. And he convinced the Army to fly him over the Oregon Trail in a biplane from Vancouver, Washington to Dayton, Ohio, to a big air show that was going on there. And he flew with a pilot named Oakley Kelly, who was an uh, Army aviator. And this is Kelly's wife wishing Meeker bon voyage. In two days, he covered the Oregon Trail in 1924, a trek that in 1852 took him five months. And uh, he, there were a couple little interesting events that happened. Uh, the first thing he did, he's, he wrote that when he got in this airplane, is he took his false teeth out and stuck them in his pocket because he was kind of worried that if they hit one of those air pockets and dropped, you know, the false teeth would go <laughs> He also made sure that every stop, there was a newspaper reporter there covering the story. He made it to Dayton, to the air show. They put him in an automobile, paraded him in front of 100,000 people, and he went up and sat with one of the Wright brothers in the audience. And then, he continued on to Washington, D.C., meeting yet another president, Calvin Coolidge. Now, Meeker met Benjamin Harrison, Teddy Roosevelt twice, Woodrow Wilson, Calvin Coolidge, and he corresponded with Herbert Hoover, who would be a future president. You know, that's five more than I've ever been friendly with. <laughs> In 1912, he started experimenting with motion pictures. And he was really early. He thought that making, make, making a feature-length mo motion picture about the Oregon Trail would be a good way to get his message out there to the public. There are just little snippets of that 1912 film still in existence. The Washington State Historical Society has a copy of it, and the Meeker Mansion has a copy. So if you ever want to see this, it's kind of neat. What he was doing was taking his covered wagon and showing how it was turned into a boat to go across the river. And here he is in the Loop Fork River in Nebraska, going across. He didn't give up on this idea of a movie. In 1923, he went to New York, 
and he started hobnobbing with some people that were very wealthy and pretty famous. Uh, a guy named George DuPont Pratt said, listen to Meeker talk about the Oregon Trail and said, let's make the movie. He put Ezra on a retainer, set him up in an office in New York City, and for the next year, Ezra was hard at work trying to get the, the movie off the ground. Pratt eventually pulled the funding, but Meeker didn't give up. So he is now 94 years old, and he writes a novel, Kate Mulhall, The Romance of the Oregon Trail. And this was intended to be the screenplay for this movie. And then he joined a Wild West show called The 101 Ranch. And his reason for joining was they had a film division. And he thought, this is the way that I could do it. They said, well, you've got to perform. And he signed a contract. And he told them that he says, I don't want any of these one-year contracts. He says, I want one at least five years. <laughs> you know? And uh, he signed up. He drove the covered wagon in their Wild West show each night. And well, sometimes he did two or three performances a day. And he was attacked by outlaws and Indians every single night. And every single night, he ran for the fort as fast as he could get there. And he would just get in in the nick of time. And so that's what he did through all of 1925. In 1926, he went back to New York City and partnered up with all his wealthy friends again. And they founded what was called the Old Oregon Trail Memorial Association. And Meeker was elected the president. And this was a national organization where they were going to lobby Congress to get in the act of funding saving the Oregon Trail. And he succeeded in 1926. Congress did it in a rather unique way. They authorized this memorial 50 cent coin and they allowed Meeker's organization to sell it for a dollar. The profits went to marking the trail or doing other trail activities. It's a beautiful coin. On the left there is Ezra Meeker leading his covered wagon west in 1852 with his wife and baby inside the wagon. And on the reverse side is a map of the United States with the Oregon Trail inscribed in it in a Native American. You can buy these things today, um, but they're considerably more than a dollar. <laughs> uh, the last time I checked, they were in the $250 range. That meant, of course, he had to sell more coins. And this is the wagon that was made for that 1923 movie. This is in Tacoma. And Ezra was quite uh, the showman on the coin selling business. But he didn't do it in a covered wagon this time. He was back in an automobile. And this is called a, a touring car. And he had a driver. And he made stop after stop along the Oregon Trail, stopping at banks and everything, getting them to sell the coins. What'd they do with the money? They put up markers like this all around the Oregon Trail from end to end. Uh, the bronze medallion in the middle, that looks familiar, doesn't it? It's the coin. And uh, in Washington State, if you want to see these, there's one at Greenwater on Highway 410 up toward Mount Rainier. There's uh, one in the City Hall in Napa Vine. And there's a couple of them over by Walla Walla. And there were a couple in Spanaway. The monuments are still there, but somebody purloined the bronze marker in the middle of it. In 1928, he did it again. Now he's 97. He got Henry Ford to build this. And he had a driver that took him from New York City to Detroit. The shock absorbers weren't working too well. And Ford said, you know, bring it to Detroit. and We'll put new shocks on it and give you better brakes, too. When Meeker arrived in Detroit, he was deathly ill. They put him in the hospital. And Henry Ford picked up the tab. And when he recovered a little bit, they put him on a train, and they sent him back to Seattle. And he died on December 3rd, 1928. And this wagon that you see here was used as part of that motion picture, and it was part of his funeral. It was the 1923 wagon. That wagon today belongs to the Puyallup Historical Society at the Meeker Mansion. And they bring it out every once in a while for events. And so if you ever see them uh, you know, with the covered wagon, it dates back from 1923.
Parts of it have been restored, parts of it are original. What happened to the original wagon? It's in the basement of the research center of the Washington State Historical Society in Tacoma, and you can visit it by appointment. Sometimes they bring it out too for exhibits and put it in the main museum downtown. Um, notice on the side there, it says, writing or defacing this wagon will be you know, prosecuted by the full extent of the law and stuff. You see the, the blue on the side of the wagon? There's a close up. It's covered with graffiti from end to end. Meeker tried at first to stop this and then finally he gave up. The bonnet's even covered with graffiti. The Pathfinder met the same fate. It was covered with graffiti from end to end. People wanted to sign their names to it. If you want to visit Dave and Dandy, they're still at their posts in the museum in Tacoma, top floor. Okay, oops, back up. No, I'm going the wrong way here. One more, there. Sometimes I'm asked, where's the end of the Oregon Trail? And the answer to that kind of depends on where you're at. For example, the Dalles here on the left says, we're the end of the Oregon Trail. Oregon City says, no, we're the end of the Oregon Trail. And Olympia says, of course, we're the end of the Oregon Trail. <laughs> well, Ezra didn't care. I mean, you know, he was dedicating monuments here in Olympia, and you saw earlier at the Dalles, both of which claim to be the end of the Oregon Trail. For the individual pioneer, the end of the Oregon Trail was wherever they stopped traveling. It, for, for their Oregon Trail trip, if it ended in the Dalles, that's where it was. If they ended in Toledo, that's where it was. Um, the whole thing about who was the real end of the Oregon Trail, is, Ezra thought, was kind of a silly argument. Now, in 2006, a group of us got together, and we decided to celebrate the centennial of Ezra's monument expedition. We drug out that 1923 wagon, we got an ox team, and we went east over the Oregon Trail just like Ezra did. We gave slideshows like this, just like Ezra did. We sold books and postcards, just like Ezra. <laughs> we even put up some monuments, just like Ezra. But we did it a little differently. <laughs> now, what we did learn is something Ezra learned. The oxen were the star of the show. People just flocked to those oxen. Every stop, it was just like a magnet. This is South Pass, Wyoming, on our recreation. This is Ray Egan portraying Ezra Meeker, and Dixon Ford portraying Mardon, and this is Susie Perkison here. South Pass is a very famous place on the Oregon Trail. It's the high point where you go over the Rocky Mountains. It was where you left the United States in 1852 and entered Oregon country and it's out in the middle of nowhere. This, Oregon, this track that you're seeing is the Oregon Trail, and when Ezra got there in 1906, he said, this needs a monument. But do you see any rocks around? <laughs> he had to travel quite a ways to find this uh, stone that now stands there, and he and Mardon brought it back, and they spent a couple days carving it, and it's been standing there now for well over 100 years. It's one of the places where you can go where you can really feel the Oregon Trail like the pioneers did. Another place you can go is Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. It's almost the same feeling. And those monuments, uh, Cloquato, Washington put up, promised in 1906 to put one up and they didn't do it. So three years later, well, 100 years later, I mean, they put up this very nice monument. Cloquato's a little town in Lewis County uh, used to be the county seat of Lewis County until I think it was uh, Centralia stole the records and hauled them over there. Uh, Chehalis is uh, put up marker downtown in 2006. And Soda Springs, Idaho came through and we had an all day party at Soda Springs and another wagon showed up and so we had company for a change. It was kind of fun. And the markers are still going up. The latest one is in Lexington, Nebraska, put up in 2015 by a Meeker relative. And you can see it's dedicated to Ezra Meeker. Now, Meeker died in 1928 at age 97. And his last words were, I can't go yet. I've got too much work to do. 
The Oregon Trail is today lined from end to end with monuments, most of, many of them dating from Meeker's time. Uh, some are in rural areas and some in very developed areas. But today there's precious few sections of the Oregon Trail that look like it did in 1852. The federal government has recognized the Oregon Trail as a National Historic Trail, but recognition does not mean protection. Today there are all sorts of pressures from private citizens to develop parts of the Oregon Trail, both on public property and private property. In an ongoing effort to preserve what's left of the Oregon Trail and to educate the American public as to its importance, the Oregon California Trails Association has adopted Meeker's mission. And that is his legacy to America. Any questions? Wow. Yeah. What happened to Mrs. Meeker? I mean, he's taken off and doing all this. Yeah. She died. <laughs> Mrs. Meeker. Okay. Um, Unfortunately, at this point in his life, Mrs. Meeker developed uh, Alzheimer's. And so when he took off on the 1906 expedition, his plan was that she was going to join him in Indianapolis for the winter and then continue on to Washington, D.C. And he got a letter from his daughter saying, Mother's taken a real turn for the worse. And so she, moved, she eventually moved in with the daughter. And Ezra came home in February to visit her, and she didn't know him. And so she died in 1909, and uh, most of this happened after her death. Any other questions? Yeah. So what's the connection to Meeker Mansion? How does that fit into this whole thing? Um, this is before all this. Uh, Ezra, when he moved to Puyallup, he lived in a log cabin when he was the wealthiest guy in the state of Washington, he lived in a log cabin. And when he was growing all those hops and everything, and his wife kind of explained to him that, you know, we have really important people coming here to visit. You know, e Ezra, you know, we can't entertain in a log cabin. And all the other hop growers were building, building these fancy mansions around the sound. And so she convinced him to build the Meeker Mansion. And he really never liked it. I mean, you know, he lived in it for about 10 years. And then uh, when he came back from the Yukon, he sold it to his daughter after his, after his wife, you know, got ill and everything. And the daughter hung on to it till 1915, and then she sold it to the Grand Army of the Republic, and it became a nursing home for Civil War soldiers. And in the 1970s, it was slated for demolition. And a group of people in, Seattle, in Puyallup got together and saved it. And today it's the headquarters for the Puyallup Historical Society. Where is he buried at? In Woodbine Cemetery in Puyallup. When you're going down 512 toward Puyallup and you're at the top of the hill, look left and the cemetery's over there and he's on the very top of the hill. So if you get in the cemetery, you'll find them. Thanks for straightening that out because uh, I was told that it was on McNeil Island underneath the Madrona tree. That was a huge Madrona tree. <laughs> no, he's not there. <laughs> yes. Is uh, Mount Meeker in Colorado named after him? Uh, it's, I think it's named after a relative called Nathan Meeker, who uh, founded the city of Greeley, Colorado. And he's, he's a, like a distant cousin. But Ezra came to Greeley once or twice to kind of, you know, touch roots with that. He's more famous in Colorado history almost. Okay. Yeah. What's considered the eastern starting point? For the Oregon Trail? Yeah. It's more like a rope that's frayed at both ends. You know, there were a whole bunch of jump off places on the Missouri and Mississippi River, uh, you know, like Indian App, I mean, uh, Independence, Missouri, Kansas City, Weston, Missouri, St. Joe, Missouri, Council Bluffs, Iowa. And people jumped off from all those places. And by the time they got into central Nebraska, all those strands met. And then they stayed pretty much together. There were a lot of shortcuts where people tried little various routes. But they pretty much stayed together until they got in the Salt Lake area, and then all of a sudden people are going to California and going to Salt Lake City and going to Oregon. And so there's a lot of branches at the end. So I call it a rope that's frayed at both ends. Mm -hmm. 
I've got a couple of questions. One is, do you have a clue to his longevity outside of God's providence uh, mm -hmm. keeping <coughs> on the earth for so long? Was it diet or everything? When he got into his 90s, he started celebrating his birthday in style. Uh, he would throw big parties and invite all sorts of people. And one of the parties that he threw, he said, it was just open to members of what he called the Borrowed Time Club. And you, the re only requirement is he had to be over 70. Well, when he got to New York, they decided to throw a party for everybody that was over 90. And the guys all sat down and they were quizzed as to what caused this longevity. And one of the guys said, drink alcohol in moderation. And another guy says, drink alcohol every day. <laughs> another guy said, don't smoke. Another guy says, smoke a cigar every day. And Ezra actually bought a book, said How to Live to Be 100. He never really could explain how come he was so vital, and he, he marveled at it most of the time. He, you know, he would write letters and says, I cannot explain my health, why I am such, you know, good shape. He had some close calls. He, you know, he had a strangulated hernia that he almost killed him when he was in his 80s, and, you know, he, he ruptured, uh, you know, had a, a, a rupture that he wore a truss for, you know, years and years, and then had to have surgery to repair it. So he had a few close calls, but basically he was pretty darn healthy up to the end. Hmm. Does the OCTA maintain a, a map online of where all these markers are? Um, I couldn't find it. <laughs> no, up there. I, my books are in the back back there. Uh, they, they're, they're, they're in there. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, if, and if you, uh, 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 yeah, uh, postcards too, yes. <laughs> And if you give me your you know, email address or something, I could send you a, uh, where to find them if you don't want to buy the book. Uh -huh. What's the estimate of the number of people who use the Oregon Trail? 250,000 is the, the current estimate. And you know, that's coming to Oregon. You're not counting the California people, which were more. Mm -hmm. Second part of that question was, uh, and you have experience in this. How many miles a day when the weather was good did he travel with the, the team and the oxen? About 20. Wow. Yeah, which, you know, for a guy 75 years old and, you know, he was 80 when he did the second time, you know, that's uh, pretty good. <laughs> Any others? Dennis, yes. Thank you. I right. have to have a Dennis Larson coin. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dennis and, his, and, and, uh, and your family will be back there selling uh, yeah. postcards and books. Yeah. So I, I would encourage you to visit him and ask him questions back here. You'll hang around for a little while, won't you? All right, good. Signatures are free. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. And this is, uh, closes out our current season of our history talks. But we'll start up again in September and we'll have a whole new lineup of speakers and topics. And it goes through mid-June. So uh, thank you for supporting this uh, history program at the Olympia Tomwater Foundation. Thank you for your donations also. That helps out a lot. And uh, come on back for house tours and river walk tours and all kinds of things going on. Thank you so much. Thank you.